Hello everyone, my name is Andy Johnson. I'm a specialty cheese coordinator here at the Center for Dairy Research. Uh, before we get into our topic, what is milk? I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, previous to CDR, I was a cheese maker for about 10 years. I started in uh, Vermont and moved to Minnesota and, made, and then made cheese here in Wisconsin at a few factories. Um, so I have sort of a diverse experience, uh, many different styles of cheese, uh, mainly focusing on you know, the small to medium size artisanal uh, cheese producer. But here at CDR, I've been here about five years. I'm sort of the point person uh, for any specialty cheese project, uh, whether that's developing uh, cheeses in our pilot plant here for clients. Uh, I do quite a bit of out outreach, meaning troubleshooting uh, quality issues, but also help uh, develop and help out in short courses like this. Um, so today we're gonna talk about what is milk. So milk, you know, obviously is the, the foundation of, you know, all the dairy products uh, we make. So obviously it's a good idea to have understanding of what milk is. Um, and it all starts here at the cow. Uh, and in my point of view, um, you know, since milk is basically created through a biological process, um, you know, that really adds a bunch of complexity, um, challenges, uh, frustrations in a lot of ways, um, but also is really rewarding uh, basically working with milk. Because it, because it is really complex. And we'll uh, get into that a little bit today in terms of its composition, its chemistry, its microbiology. Um, so um, we'll start there. So there is a legal definition of milk. Uh, and you will find this. Um, I think this is from the PMO um, or the FDA standard of identity. Um, but as a basis, it's a good idea to understand the definition. So milk is a lacteal secretion, meaning it comes from a mammal, uh, practically free of colostrum. Uh, so colostrum uh, is otherwise known as the first milk. So that's the first milk that comes out of a, uh, a cow um, after it gives birth. Um, and colostrum is, it's sort of like milk, uh, but there's it has a very different composition, uh, particularly has a lot of antibodies in it. Uh, which makes sense. It's good for the baby, um, but it's not good for uh, dairy processing, so it's actually illegal to use colostrum. Uh, but it's obtained by the complete milking of one or more healthy cows, goats, sheep, water, buffalo, or other hooved animals. Um, so there is a, a definition to work from, and we won't get into the other uh, milks that are out there, the, the nut milks, the soy milks, the other nut juices. Uh, but so uh, for our purposes, this is our definition of milk. There are uh, standards, microbiological standards of milk. Um, the ones we're talking about here in terms of grade A raw milk standards, you can find those at DADCAP 65. So that's the Wisconsin egg uh, uh, rule or the uh, number. And then there's the PMO or pasteurized milk ordinance from the uh, FDA and USDA. So there are microbiological standards. Uh, the first one up there is the standard plate count. Many of you are familiar with that. SPC, uh, so the maximum legal limit for raw, uh, grade A raw milk is 100,000 bacteria per mil. So, you know, that's a lot of bacteria. That's basically the maximum you can have before there's some legal regulatory action. You know, typically a good farm, bulk milk farm, or bulk milk from a farm would be probably around, you know, uh, less than 10,000, probably around 5,000 uh, cells per mil. That would be a good or excellent milk quality number. Um, similarly, there's a standard plate count for um, milk prior to pasteurization. So what that means is that the, that's the milk that you guys um, get into your processing plant. Typically, it's co-mingled uh, from many other farms, uh, but there's a legal limit there of less than 300,000. Again, you'll be well under that number. Similarly, somatic cells, um, raw grade A milk has to be less than 750,000 somatic cells per milliliter. Um, but a good farm, you know, is uh, under 200,000. So those are some regulatory legal limits. Uh, but again, when in your processing plant, you know, you'll have your own standards probably, Billy, and they'll be well under those numbers. Some other good general rules of thumb, um, assume pathogens are on raw milk. Uh, we know that pathogens aren't always in raw milk, but it's good to assume that in terms of how you handle it uh, within your processing plant. Um, and your processing plants are all set up to do that in terms of it's segregated and you have all your GMPs and SOPs um, set up uh, to keep uh, raw milk from cross-contaminating the rest of the plant or products. Ge another general good rule of thumb, the fresher the milk, the better. 
So when we're talking about milk, it's basically a race against time. Uh, milk is freshest and best, you know, as soon as it comes out of the udder. And then there's, uh, basically it goes downhill from there. Now we can do certain things to preserve the quality of raw milk. Uh, you know, we chill it and we transport it in certain tanks, you know, that limits the cross contamination. Um, and we try to process it as soon as possible. Um, but that's just a good rule of thumb. Pasteurization is not sterilization, but it kills all pathogens in milk. Um, so that's true. The pasteurization is the only legal uh, way to process milk that we know it kills all pathogens. Uh, but it's not sterilization, so it's good to remember that um, certain bacteria, not the non-pathogenic kind, can survive pasteurization and cause problems, quality problems, um, later on. And also pasteurization is not a uh, cure-all in terms of having poor quality raw milk. So if you have poor quality, quality raw milk, that's going to transfer to poor quality um, dairy products, whether that's cheese or dairy powders or whey powders. So now we'll get into a little bit about milk composition. Uh, this is one of the first complexities we'll talk about. Um, you can see here is a typical uh, cow uh, milk composition, uh, but we'll break this down uh, further here in the next few slides. So first up, what I want to address is the effect of species on composition of milk. Uh, it should be no surprise that when you're talking about different species of milk, you'll get different compositions. Uh, so cow is king around here. Uh, we usually compare everything to cow. Um, but there's other, obviously, um, species uh, in the U.S., uh, particularly goat and sheep. Uh, goat probably being the most common after cow um, than sheep. Uh, but also there's a couple water buffalo herds, a couple camel herds. I don't think there's any horse herds uh, that we're milking currently in the United States. But obviously... Some of these other species are very common or popular in other parts of the world. Uh, so it's a good idea to sort of know something about these milks. Uh, but anyway, um, different species, you'll have typically a different composition. Uh, cow and goat are pretty similar in terms of composition. Uh, but when you talk about sheep or buffalo or some of these different more exotic uh, species around here at least, um, you'll have different, very, very different compositions. Um, you can start by looking at the solids at the bottom here, uh, particularly we compare cow to sheep. Uh, sheep is known to have a lot more solids, uh, particularly the fat and the casein. So that's something for you just to think about. Uh, another thing I'd like to note is the lactose. You can see here pretty much across all the species here, uh, besides horse, you know, the lactose is, is pretty consistent. Effective breed on cow composition. Um, so focus on cow because that's mainly uh, what we work with. Um, you can see here the different breeds of cows. They're the most common uh, breeds of cows in the U.S. Uh, Holstein being the most common. I would say 95 to 98 percent at least of the milk volume in the U.S. is uh, from Holsteins. Uh, but then we have uh, probably four other most common breeds. Uh, we call these the colored breeds, the Brown Swiss, the Ayrshire, the Jersey, and the Guernsey. Um, but so within breeds, uh, typically They'll give you different milk compositions. Now, a lot of this has to do with feed and things, but in general, um, these, these sort of trends here hold true. So Holstein, let me know, give you the lowest amount of components or the least amount of fat and protein, but the most volume of milk um, compared to, a, a, on the other side of the coin, uh, Jersey or in Guernsey. Um, they'll, they'll give you the least amount of milk, but it'll have the most amount of solids. You can see here, fat and protein is what what typically we look at. And again, the lactose pretty much uh, remains constant. Similarly, uh, you know, species, different species will give you different milk compositions, different breeds within a species. We just talked about cows. Uh, the other thing we need to address is lactation cycle. So obviously, uh, being a mammal, you have to, you know, be pregnant to give milk and you have to give birth. So um, they have a lactation cycle just like every other mammal. So a typical cow lactation cycle is about 305 days. Um, you can see that here on this graph. Uh, what we're measuring here is the fat and the protein. That's, that's the major components that we care about as cheesemakers and dairy processors in addition to lactose. But So this typical trend here during lactation, uh, so a typical lactation cycle is you'd calf, um, you'd have higher sal solids uh, once you give birth here. They dip down in the next few weeks, and then they'd slowly rise up um, as the lactation cycle extends. Um, you can see here again that uh, lactose pretty much remains constant. Uh, but this is a standard sort of curve here we'll see uh, 
um, as the um, as the cow goes through the lactation cycle in terms of the dip of fat and protein. Um, I will say that you know from a herd basis, uh, this this phenomenon is sort of mollified uh, in the sense that um, most dairies they calve or give birth um, all year round, um, so we don't see this effect. You know, um, I do work with some seasonal dairies uh, where they do calf all the cows at the same time in the spring, and then they dry them off all at the same time in the fall. And that's where you really get this pronounced effect on your herd, um, on the milk, as this every cow is on the same lactation cycle. Uh, but that's not necessarily true anymore, given the modern dairies. Similarly to lactation cycle, there's always there's also a seasonal variation in milk composition. Uh, I'll have to say that this is not that well understood why cows go through this, but it's something deep in their evolution and physiology. Uh, but it sort of does follow the same uh, lactation cycle uh, composition as we see here. Um, we'll have the highest components uh, in the in the winter or fall or winter, and then as summer progresses, those components go down. And then they'll go back up, obviously, in the fall and winter. Um, so you can see some averages here. This is from the federal milk order here, um, cow's milk. Uh, I will point out here the somatic cell again. Uh, we talked about the federal uh, regulatory maximum limit of 750,000 cells, somatic cells. Uh, but again, most dairies are well under that. And you can see here the average is you know, around 150 or so somatic cells per, uh, per mil. Similarly, this basically this is a graphic form of what you just saw on that table, uh, but milk composition changes with time. So here's the season. Now uh, this isn't necessarily the lactation cycle, but as a herd, uh, we've measured the uh, amount of fat, protein, ash, and lactose. Um, and as the months go by, you know, from the spring uh, to the to the winter, you know, we'll see this dip in fat. We'll see the similar dip in protein. Um, see this dip in ash, uh, lactose. This graph is a little. Mis uh, Deceiving, but basically it stays the same, you know, or it's very consistent compared to the other uh, components. So that's real quick on a milk composition and how it changes. So, you know, obviously as a dairy processor, we have to be aware of how the milk changes. Now we'll do things like measure the composition and know what it is before we process it. And a lot of our operations standardize. So we can get ahead of that, and basically, as we know, you know what what your milk is, the composition of your milk is the composition of your, your dairy product. So um, that's obviously one big reason why we we standardize. But it's good to know that that composition changes, basically just through the biology of the cow. Uh, so, all right, the next few slides we'll talk about dairy chemistry. Um, sort of break down the the components uh, that we just talked about. Uh, so the basic component groups um, of milk, and this pretty much holds true for any any type of milk. Like we said, the component numbers will change, but are basically um, the milk has the same uh, components. Um, so most of milk is water. So a typical cow's milk um, is about 87% water. Uh, and so if you think about the dairy products we manufacture, one of the big goals is basically we want to reduce that water or get rid of that water, you know, unless we're selling fluid milk. Uh, so with cheese manufacturer, in terms of preservation, we try to get that water down. You know, a typical uh, moisture on a cheddar type cheese is around 37% or so. Um, that helps preserve, obviously, the dairy product, uh, but also makes it easier to ship, too. Um, milk fat, we'll talk more about milk fat. Uh, typical cow's milk fat around 35 to 4%. Uh, the protein, we'll talk more about that, broken down into casein and whey protein. The carbohydrate or lactose, milk sugar, and then there's minerals and salts uh, in cow's milk. Some of that is good for nutrition. Uh, that does play a big role in uh, cheese manufacture, but not so much in other dairy products. And of course, the vitamins, again, don't play a too big a role in dairy processing, but um, important in terms of uh, nutrition. So what's in milk? We'll break these down to further uh, protein. So when we talk about protein, we talk about casein and whey protein, the two, uh, two proteins in milk. Casein is known as the cheesemaker's protein. That's what the cheesemaker is trying to concentrate or capture in the cheese. And then the rest of the whey or the serum proteins go out in the whey. Uh, but obviously those have value. Uh, whey proteins are some of the most nutritious proteins we know of. So um, there is a lot of value there. We'll talk a little bit more about the fat or the triglycerides. 
Okay, so you see here there's this glycerol backbone and these three tri or fatty acids attached to it, and these can be of varying lengths. Um, and those fats uh, differ in that way. Um, but basically you have triglycerides, which are made up of glycerol backbone and a bunch of different types or lengths of fatty acids. Then we have the carbohydrate or the lactose. Uh, that's glucose and galactose. Uh, what's important there is in terms of dairy processing is those will hold or bind water. Uh, lactate, or fancy name for lactic acid, is very important in dairy products, particularly cheese, yogurts, etc. And then we'll have the minerals. Spend too much time talking about minerals, but um, nutrition-wise, of course. Uh, but there's also issues, particularly with cheese making. We talk calcium and calcium phosphate, uh, and how much calcium you retain in your cheese affects the texture and how it breaks down. But also in terms of dairy powder processing, calcium and those things can uh, be issues. Uh, plus, there's a bunch of vitamins, enzymes. Uh, don't forget all the other bacteria uh, that's in there. So milk is really a complex thing, and it's a living thing. And like we said, it's basically a race against time in terms of processing fresh raw milk uh, into dairy products uh, in terms of quality. So, so to dive in a little further, milk fat uh, is present in milk and cream as a fat and water emulsion. Uh, basically, that fat globule uh, basically acts, uh, keeps it emulsified to a certain extent in the water phase of the milk, uh, but it will cream, as you can see here, given time or some type of disturbance. You know, that cream uh, will break uh, the emulsion and it'll rise to the top. Um, you know, that was standard back in the day to get that cream top milk. Uh, now most of the food milk is homogenized. Um, milk uh, is the largest and lightest particle, or fat is the lightest and largest particle in milk. You can see here this picture, uh, the big large fat globules compared to the casein micelles or the whey protein. So that has uh, big impacts in terms of uh, processing uh, the milk which we'll talk about here. Uh, milk fat is uh, the basis for payment of milk. Uh, typically it's fat and protein and there's some uh, microbiological standard um, that it, that's given or paid to the dairy farmer. Uh, but fat affects body and color of the product. Uh, we know that fat is, you know, for lack of a better description, gushy. You know, it has a melting point. It gets softer as it gets warmer. Color of the product, uh, you can see here in this picture, uh, you know, the vitamin A is expressed or retained in the fat. Um, so the more vitamin A or the pasture, uh, pasture grazed animals, they'll have a more yellow or um, orangish milk and uh, uh, cheese product. Fat contributes to flavor, of course, uh, but there's a lot of defects and issues or challenges uh, that can occur uh, because of the milk fat. It can interfere with the functionality of agreement, agree, uh, ingredients. You can have difficulty foaming proteins uh, because that large fat globule gets in the way. And probably most importantly with powders, um, there's a bunch of off flavors and other storage issues. Uh, fat is not that stable. Um, if it's, you know, the globule membrane is disrupted, um, it's easily uh, oxidizable, um, off flavors, texture issues. So a lot of issues around milk fat in terms of dairy products. Moving on to milk proteins. Uh, there's two main groups in milk and whey, uh, the casein and the whey protein. So in typical cow's milk, there's about 80% casein and 20% whey protein. Uh, so in a cheese making operation, we want to capture as much of that casein as possible, and the rest of that um, protein and the whey protein is going to go out with the whey um, for further processing. Proteins are made up of amino acids, which are made up of nitrogen, carbogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, so that's what, that's what uh, proteins are made of. 95% um, of nitrogen in milk is formed of protein. Um, the other remainder, and this is important in terms of sort of an analytical standpoint, is non-protein nitrogen. So nine, one way to think about non-protein nitrogen is basically it's the precursors um, to make protein, um, which the cow could have used to make protein, but it didn't. Um, so that's the nitrogen and other things in the milk. Um, um, that are protein, but they show up on certain protein tests. Like if you uh, measure total protein or crude protein, you get that non-protein nitrogen in that in that number, um, as opposed to true protein, which doesn't include that non-protein uh, nitrogen amount. So, to break down protein further, I'll talk about casein or the cheesemaker's protein. Approximately 80% of protein in milk, like we talked about. Um, certain characteristics of casein, it binds calcium, which is important definitely in cheese making and other dairy powders. 
Um, but there's also a group of s several proteins with varying attributes. So it's just not as simple as saying there's, you know, casein in milk, um, given different species, particularly with, like within cow, um, but different, uh, different among different species like goat and cow, um, the makeup of these caseins, what we have here in this table, the alpha, the beta, the kappa, the gamma, um, can vary greatly, uh, which can affect uh, the functionality and the downstream effects of uh, processing the milk. Um, one good example of that is the goat milk is very deficient in alpha S1 pro or casein compared to cow, um, so that leads to very different textural uh, attributes to goat cheese compared to cow cheese, just based on the different the different casein makeup. Some other things about casein. Caseins are joined together to form large structures that are known as micelles. We'll talk a little bit more about micelles. Uh, but basically, micelles are held together with calcium. I'll have a picture of that here in a second. Micelles have a net negative charge. Uh, so what that means is basically they're suspended in the water phase. and that they, they don't attract to each other just because uh, uh, opposites uh, repel each other. Um, Holds more water as part of a structure than in dry matter. Uh, casein does not denature, that's important, as opposed to whey proteins, which do denature, which we'll talk about. Um, kappa casein is cut by rennet, causing casein to join together to form cheese curd. That's the basis of rennet um, coagulation, uh, which we'll talk about here in a second as well. So this is sort of a picture of the casein micelle. Uh, you can see here there's many different caseins joined together. Uh, by calcium. You can think about calcium. Calcium phosphate is the glue that holds the micelle together. And then the outside, uh, the kappa casein, it have these little hairs. Uh, so in cheese manufacture, we basically clip, the coagulant clips these negative hairs, or we reach a, a very low pH where that these repulsion forces that are out on the outside of these micelles are neutralized, and then these caseins like to stick together, and that's how we form our cheese curd. Um, so very complex. You can see here's a little image of it uh, from a microscope, but these are very complex uh, molecules. So moving on, we talked about casein. Now we we'll talk about the other protein in milk, whey proteins. Again, very important. You know, back in the day, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, uh, whey was seen as sort of a byproduct, um, but obviously um, it's not seen as a byproduct anymore. Um, most cheese operations of any size need to capture the value in their way, particularly the whey proteins if they want to actually make any money. But you can see here uh, on the right these images. These are um, sort of representations of the, some of the different uh, whey proteins. Uh, they sort of look like a jumbled mess, uh, but they are very orderly, uh, and they, again, they're very complex. Um, you know, whey proteins, also known as serum proteins, that are dissolved in the water portion of the milk or whey. Um, but they are um, sensitive to heat and will denature uh, where caseins won't. And this is a very important uh, topic here, uh, whey protein denaturation. So in milk, the whey proteins, uh, again, we said, are kind of look like this. They're all folded up uh, tightly together. And then they will denature uh, when you add heat. Uh, so varying levels of heat. We we're talking about cheese manufacture when we're talking relatively low amounts of heat. Um, you know, high temperature, short time pasteurization, 161 degrees or so. Um, you will denature a certain amount of whey proteins, although it's small, small enough that it won't affect the cheese making process. Um, but if you go hotter than that and longer than that, um, you'll denature more and more whey proteins, which is a negative uh, for most cheeses, but for some cheeses, that's what you want. For like a ricotta type cheese, you actually want to denature these whey, whey, uh, whey proteins. Um, but in general, it's not it's not conducive. But anyway, so you have this whey protein, you add heat, it starts to unfold or unwrap or denature, um, and then they start to attract to each other and stick to each other. Um, a good example of that outside the dairy world is an egg. Uh, you know, you fry an egg, um, and once you fry that and the proteins become denatured, um, you know, you can't reverse that process. Another concept with this whey protein denaturation um, is typically, um, like in a ricotta type cheese manufacturing operations, you want to have a certain amount of casein uh, while you denature those proteins. Um, so when you denature pro whey proteins by themselves, they'll stick together. Um, but also if you have casein in the mix, um, they'll also stick to the casein and whey proteins, um, which um, basically has effects on the functionality of products, uh, particular cheese, but also with uh, 
with dairy powders. Moving on from protein to lactose. So again, lactose or the carbohydrate or the milk sugar. Um, it is a disaccharide, meaning there's two different sugars attached to each other, the glucose and galactose. Uh, now in cheese manufacturing, uh, sometimes all the lactose is used up and converted to lactic acid. Um, sometimes there's lactose left over. Sometimes certain starter bacteria um, digest the, the glucose and not all the galactose. Um, so there can be sugar left over um, in the in the cheese in the in the way. Um, there's alpha and beta forms. Uh, that's important um, because beta uh, is non-hydroscopic, meaning it won't absorb water. So that can play a big role in terms of powder and um, whether your powders absorb water or not. Um, some are not as sweet as other sugar, or lactose isn't as sweet as other sugars. Uh, limited solubility compared to many sugars, uh, but it, again, it is the largest component in milk. Keep that in mind. We oftentimes focus on the protein and fat, uh, but oftentimes lactose is the largest uh, solid or, or component. Minerals, also known as ash or milk salts, uh, major minerals in uh, milk are calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium, etc. Calcium phosphate is a big deal, or calcium in cheese manufacture, in terms of how much you retain. Uh, it has big uh, impacts on texture and functionality, but um, not too much of a concern um, in dairy powders or whey powders, um, besides the processing issues. Um, and they can be dramatic. Uh, results of cal calcium precipitation, you know, they can decrease evaporator run times, um, increase time required for acid and cleaning. Uh, basically, they just clog up um, your systems in terms of whether you're filtering or drying or spraying. Vitamins in milk, uh, not too much of a big role in terms of cheese making or uh, dairy powders. Um, obviously the nutrition in them, uh, some are water soluble like riboflavin. You can see here, here's a cheese brine. That's why that color, or the brine is that color. That's actually the riboflavin coming out of the cheese. Um, some are fat soluble, uh, for instance, uh, vitamin A which expresses itself in the, the fat of the milk. So you can see that if it's a higher vitamin A, uh, particularly with pasture grazed animals, you can see here it, it's a darker yellow or orange cheese. Non-protein nitrogen, again, uh, component in milk. Um, it's not too much of a concern. It's just uh, being aware of um, how your protein, overall protein is measured in your milk, uh, whether that's represented or not in, your, in, in that milk value. Um, Certain amount of that is uh, it plays a role in cheese manufacture, but uh, that's only in specialty varieties like Swiss potentially. Lactic acid, uh, something that needs to be addressed, as um, you know, a lot of the way that you all process some of the uh, is uh, from the cheese making process. So we'll have lactic acid in it, um, but for cheese makers, obviously it's essential for most cheeses. Uh, lactic acid is formed during the cheese making process. Uh, it's essential in terms of flavor, texture, um, helps clot the milk, adds flavor to the final cheese. Um, basically what happens, it's used, it's produced by splitting lactose into glucose and galactose, um, and it's and converts those sugars into lactic acid. Um, on a drying end or a powder end, you know, galactose, if there's lactose left over, depending on the cheese variety being uh, manufactured, um, that can be sticky. Uh, lactic acid is also sticky. Uh, so that can cause issues on the dairy powder end. Testing of milk. Uh, now we're going to uh, basically talking, talking about how to measure acidity in milk. We'll talk a little bit about uh, microbiology of milk. Uh, but pH, this is probably a review for most of you. Uh, pH, uh, we can use that as an indicator of milk quality, raw milk quality. Uh, we measure pH of the curd and whey uh, in milk throughout the cheese making process. Uh, common in other, you know, dairy products as well. But the pH scale, uh, the fancy definition is the concentration of hydrogen ions. Um, and we all know the pH scale of 14 is alkaline and zero is acid. Um, most cheese varieties are around 5 to 5.5 uh, pH. Uh, but obviously very common in the dairy processing environments to have a, a pH probe and meter and to measure the pH. Titratable acidity, another way, or TA, another way of measuring acid. Uh, basically use this apparatus you can see over here on your right, this acidometer. Um, it's another method of expressing acidity. Um, what we read the units in are uh, percent lactic acid. 
Um, although if you think about, um, well, one of the confusing things about this test is that if you measure fresh raw milk, it should have a titratable acidity of around 0.16 or so, depending on the milk. Um, but if fresh raw milk should not have any lactic acid in it. Um, so titratable acidity measures other things like phosphates and casein. So um, TA and pH aren't really comparable. Uh, titratable acidity does measure acidity once, um, for instance, you're in the cheese making process, um, you'll start creating acid and that value will increase. Um, but it, it basically TA measures other things other than lactic acid, um, like the solids in the milk, the casein. So um, it's not the same as pH, but we can use it as a tool to measure acidity and other things in the milk. Um, somewhat still common uh, in cheese operations, uh, but most people uh, just measure pH. Water activity, another uh, uh, important concept to introduce. Uh, so water activity is basically the amount of free water um, in food, whether it's milk, cheese, dairy powders, that is available for microbial growth. Um, so obviously the less water, the lower the water activity, the more stable and the more um, storable that product is. Um, obviously if you think about water as a value of one, uh, milk is close to that. Um, but certain cheeses, you know, uh, go down from there. And then if you think about powders, have a really low water activity of 0.1 to 0.3. Um, so if you see here on the right, there's a table of some of the more common uh, pathogens that we find in dairy products. Um, you know, powders are well below um, that water activity, uh, which is good. That gives them, you know, some amount of uh, food safety and, you know, storability. But again, uh, some of these, these bugs can still survive uh, at low water activities. They just can't grow. Um, so that's an important concept to keep in mind, even though they can't grow. Uh, once they come out of that low water activity, whether you rehydrate the powder uh, or something like that, they can potentially still grow. So, but water activity is another important concept in terms of food safety and quality. Somatic cells, we talked about this basically as a general indicator of milk quality. Uh, somatic cells are basically white blood cells that the cow produces uh, in the udder uh, to respond uh, to uh, infection. Typically, the infection is Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, so a healthy cow uh, is going to have a low somatic cell count, and an unhealthy cow is going to have a higher somatic cell count, um, and that's an indicator of milk quality. Uh, so some of these somatic cells have, um, you know, break down the protein, uh, they can, the cow can be sick in other ways um, that basically um, hurts uh, the milk quality. Uh, so healthy cow produces uh, good quality milk and that's, that's what we need to have. Other microorganisms, microorganisms in general, uh, milk contains microorganisms. Um, it should be no surprise whether that's in the raw milk. And like we said, even after pasteurization, some pasteurization our pasteurization doesn't kill all the microorganisms. It just reduces them to a low number. Um, when we talk about microorganisms, there's different ways to classify them. One way is by the shape. You can see here over on the right, we talk about cocci or round bacteria or bacilli, uh, rod-shaped uh, bacteria. Uh, but again, pasteurization is the only processing step that eliminates any disease-causing pathogens in milk. But again, it's not sterilization. There's still some uh, bugs uh, that can survive pasteurization. All the pathogens should be killed, uh, but uh, if you have high numbers of bacteria or microorganisms in your raw milk, um, some of those are going to survive uh, even after pasteurization. More on microorganisms. Uh, another way to classify microorganisms besides shape is uh, their temperature requirements. Uh, so there's thermophilic who are heat loving. Mesophilic, who love that middle range of temperatures, and then psychotrophic, um, who grow at cold temperatures. So even, uh, you know, we refrigerate milk, uh, there's, there's bugs, potential issues, microorganisms that can grow in cold milk, even while it's being refrigerated. There's ones that can grow at, you know, room temperature, and even, uh, you know, like we said, at pasteurization or past pasteurization temps. Um, microorganisms or bacteria also have different oxygen requirements. Some can grow in oxygen, some um, is tox oxygen is toxic to them. Real quick, a few slides on testing for microorganisms. Uh, standard plate count, which we've talked about a few times, uh, that's just a count of uh, the viable bacteria. There's a couple different methods to do that, whether you use a petri film here you can see in the middle or a, a auger plate. 
standard plate count, again, is just a measure of total bacteria, total viable uh, alive bacteria. Um, standard plate count only measures mesophiles. Um, you have to use other methods or incubation temperatures to get to those cold-loving or those, those heat-loving uh, microbes or bacteria. And it's just a very general test. Like we said, it's a general indicator of quality. It really doesn't tell you what types of bacteria are in uh, your milk or product. More on testing for microorganisms, coliforms, either in your, your milk or your dairy product. Um, coliforms are, uh, come from the intestinal tract of warm-blooded animals. So if, the present, if you have coliforms in your product, um, it's, a, it's an indicator that basically you have an uh, unsanitary condition issue, um, basically it cross-contaminated from your raw or your environment into your pasteurized product, whether that's uh, pasteurized fluid milk or cheese or, or dairy powders. Yeasts, uh, generally not a concern in the dairy powder world, but can be in the cheese world. Again, uh, yeast uh, typically love uh, salt or can tolerate salt environments, so we got all the issues with uh, cheese brines. That's where you get a lot of our yeasts. Uh, but again, not too much of a concern in the dairy powder world, uh, but it's worth talking about. Molds, similarly, uh, not too much of an issue in uh, dairy powders, but in the cheese world, um, it can be a big issue. Uh, a lot of waste goes to mold, whether that mold grows on uh, the outside of cheeses that we don't want it to. Uh, in my world, the artisan cheese world, of course, there's certain cheeses like blue and other natural rinded cheeses where we want molds, certain molds to grow on the outside or inside of the cheese. But a um, huge amount of cheeses lost each year um, to extraneous molds that uh, break down the cheese. But again, basically a cleaning and sanitation issue or an air handling issue. Uh, within the processing plant. Pathogens, again, uh, part, part of what we do as a dairy processor is we want to make high quality products, but also uh, make safe products. Uh, so pathogens, when we talk about pathogens, what we mean is disease-causing microorganisms. They're sort of separate from the quality, uh, quality micro, uh, microorganisms that cause quality issues. Uh, so. The big, some of the big disease-causing pathogens or pathogens are E. coli, salmonella, listeria, staphylococcus aureus. Um, in general, almost all production plants send out for pathogen testing. You don't want to be growing or isolating these pathogens in your internal lab at your processing plant. Um, these are very specific tests, uh, although very common nowadays uh, to have your, have your dairy products uh, tested for pathogens. Uh, some of the issues are with sampling, which your quality folks uh, deal with on a daily basis. It's basically looking, looking for a small population of uh, pathogens in a large uh, lot or amount of product. Uh, but your quality folks uh, typically have that under control. Pathogen in raw, in raw milk, uh, just to give an idea of some of these uh, pathogen outbreaks. Again, this is, this is raw milk in the United States uh, from 98 to 2013. Um, some of the pathogens you probably recognize here, Campylobacter, responsible for a lot, uh, large number of outbreaks, but again, it's very susceptible to uh, pasteurization, uh, just like all these, these pathogens. Uh, pasteurization easily kills these. Um, so, I mean, I think the general consensus is that, you know, raw milk, uh, you know, sort of the risks outweigh the benefits in terms of, you know, drinking raw milk, uh, but just to give you an idea of the of the uh, pathogens that are in, in raw milk. The last concept we need to introduce um, is that of spores. Uh, so basically a spore is a dormant stage of a vegetative cell. Um, you can see here the picture on the right, and these bacteria are stained red. Um, in this, these bacteria, they, they uh, experience some type of stress. Um, so they started producing these spores or these dormant little uh, vessels uh, that we'll talk about here in a second. But these spores are very resistant to heat, chemicals, and drying. Um, some examples are Clostridium and Bacillus um, cause issues in the cheese world, but can cause uh, a lot of issues you know, in the dairy, the dairy powder uh, world. Um, bacteria spores that have different oxygen levels and temperature requirements. Uh, some are aerobic, some are anaerobic. Uh, cypotrophic, mesophilic, thermophilic. Uh, so there's all different types of spores um, that have different requirements and uh, can grow in different different environments. Uh, but typically, it's an indication of unsanitary production pra practices. 
Um, somehow spores come in through the milk, um, and then they get lodged or can deposit themselves in the dairy plant environment, um, particularly if they're not cleaned or sanitized properly. Um, so, so basically, uh, these spores or these bacteria, uh, it's one way to survive. Um, you know, high heat, high stress conditions. Um, these form these uh, spores, as you can see this picture on the right. This bacteria cell is forming the spore. Uh, basically, it's a dormant stage or dormant form of that of that bacteria cell. Um, and what that happens is basically that can stay dormant for uh, days, weeks, probably years, um, until the right conditions uh, occur, and then it basically it'll wake up again and become a live cell, um, which obviously can cause issues. Um, Oftentimes, they can germinate um, with heat shock, even within minutes. If you think about pasteurization temperatures or drying temperatures, um, these spores can wake up, um, and then they become active again and then cause uh, quality issues. You can see here the picture on the left. We sort of saw this before. Uh, you can see all these little bacteria, uh, these little rods here, and um, some of them are forming spores. You can see them on internally in the bacteria, and then they're basically shooting them out um, into the environment. You can see the little spores there, uh, basically the dormant form of that bacteria, and they're ready to germinate um, under the right conditions uh, to cause issues later. Um, you can see here another representation of a spore. Um, but again, uh, many different layers. It's very heat, chemical resistant. Um, so once these are in your plant, um, they're very hard to get rid of. And once they're in your product, um, you know, basically it's, it's very difficult to get rid of them um, and they can wake up, germinate uh, and cause issues just like a live uh, bacteria would. All right, uh, real quick in summary, um, that's all I had for today. Uh, but again, milk is a major source of nutrition uh, in terms of a dairy processor, at least my point of view. Uh, we're, we want to produce high quality products, but we also want to um, produce food, uh, safe products. Uh, and again, I can't overstress uh, the complexity of milk you know, as the foundational ingredient of what we do here as dairy processors. Um, today, I talked a little bit about the you know, composition, the chemistry, the microbiology. Um, there's a lot more to know, but you know, it's just such a complex substance uh, to work with, which um, you know, uh, you know, translates to complexity further down the line um, as we process it. So anyway, um, let us know if you have any questions, uh, but I thanks, thank you for taking this course and uh, uh, hope you enjoy it.